this is Jen and today I want to go over this article from the Mises Institute by Jeff Deist. This is dated 1-30-2015 and it's called Secession Begins at Home. So he's writing on personal secession and how people can do certain things to seed from the union at a personal level. <clears throat> and he's basically saying that this is where it starts. So presumably everyone in the room. Now, just before we get started, I want to point out to you that if you don't want to watch this video, you can go to the website. I'll post a link and way down at the bottom, there's a recording and you can listen to his talk. Okay. So you don't have to listen to my video and you don't have to listen to me talk. You can just go here and listen to uh, him talk and um, he probably will I'm sure say things um, a lot more clearly than I can. But this is his article and it's written based on his talk given at the Houston Mises Circle in, in January of 2015. And he says, uh, Mises wrote in 1927, the situation of having to belong to a state, which I'd like to point out to you that the state created by the constitution and the state that was altered by Lincoln are two different states. The one created by Lincoln was a legal state, okay, which he forced upon people. Okay, so the situation of having to belong to a state or legal state, which is man's creation, to which one does not wish to belong is no less onerous if it is the result of an election then if one must endure it as the consequence of military conquest, which is what uh, Lincoln did, or an election, which was done um, uh, at ratification for the Constitution. So um, so he's saying that they're, they're the same, and Lincoln did this in 1866, uh, 67, and then the Constitution did it before that. Um, there's a philosophy of law by some legal scholars who say that if a person does not agree to something, then you can't have an election to force him into it. That if he doesn't agree, then he doesn't have to be a part of it. Otherwise he's, he's forced to be a part of it. And that includes, uh, any, anything. So if you want to corporatize your state, and you take a vote and the majority of people want corporatization of the state, if one person disagrees, then it can't, it can't occur. So Jeff writes, I'm sure this sentiment is shared by many of you. Mises understood that mass democracy was no substitute for liberal society. And remember liberal in those days was um, conservative or libertarian but rather the enemy of it. Of course he was right. Nearly a hundred years later, we have been conquered and occupied by the state and its phony veneer of democratic elections. It calls it a phony veneer of democratic elections. And I would agree because, you know, and you've probably heard that two choices is not really a choice and that um, the majority is mob rule over the minority and oftentimes the majority is wrong and make bad decisions. That's, you know, goes along with the herd mentality, you know, the zombies represented in the, as zombies in many of the shows today. Okay. The federal government is now the putative ruler of nearly every aspect of life in America because the people who want a mama and a daddy government outnumber the people who are independent and uh, can take care of themselves. That's where, why we're here today entertaining the audacious idea of secession, an idea Mises elevated to a defining principle of classical liberalism. It's tempting and entirely human to close our eyes tight and resist radical change to live in America's past. But to borrow a line from the novelist L.P. Hartley, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. The America we thought we knew is a mirage, a memory, a foreign country. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is precisely why we should take secession seriously, both conceptually as consistent with libertarianism and as a real alternative for the future. Does anyone really believe that a physically vast, multicultural, social democratic welfare state of 330 million people with hugely diverse economic, social, and cultural interests can be commanded from D.C. indefinitely without intense conflict and economic strife? I don't. Does anyone really believe that we can unite under a state that endless, endlessly divides us? Rich versus poor, black versus white, Hispanic versus Anglo, men versus women, old versus young, secularist versus Christian, gays versus traditionalist, taxpayers versus entitlement recipients, urban versus rural, red state versus blue state, and the political class versus everybody. Frankly, it seems that, uh, frankly, it seems clear the federal government is hell bent on blanketizing American any, America anyway. So why not seek out ways to split apart rational, rationally and nonviolently? Why dismiss secession, the pragmatic alternative that's uh, staring us in the face? Since most of us in the room are Americans, my focus today is our, my focus today is on the political and cultural situation here at home. But the same principles of self-ownership, self-determination, and decentralization apply universally whether we're considering Texas independent or dozens of active breakaway movements in places like Venice, Catalonia, Scotland, and Belgium. I truly believe secession movements represent the last best hope for reclaiming our birthright, the great classical liberal tradition, and the civilization it made possible. In a world gone mad with state power, secession offers hope that truly liberal societies organized around civil society and markets rather than central governments can still exist. And I would agree because in my area, there's three places where I can get uh, chicken eggs, goose eggs, duck, chicken. There's a rancher who sells beef and raw milk. And there's another lady who's not too far from here who sells pork. Um, so I can get pig, I can get pork, beef, milk eggs, chicken, goose, um, duck, all in, all in my area. And I can bet you that if the dollar was valueless, I could take gold or silver, probably silver or even copper and make purchases from them for their, um, for their goods. Secession as a bottom-up revolution. But how could this ever really happen, you're probably thinking. Wouldn't create, creating a viable secession movement in the United States necessarily mean convincing a majority of Americans, or at least a majority of the electorate, to join a mass political campaign, much like, the pre like a presidential election? I say no. Building a libertarian secession movement need not involve mass political organizing. In fact, national political movements that pander to the left and right may well be hopelessly naive and wasteful of time and resources. Instead, our focus would be on hyper-localized resistance to the federal government in the form of bottom-up revolution, as Hans Hermann Hoppe terms it. Hoppe counsels us to use what little daylight the state affords us defensively just as force is justified only in self-defense, the use of democratic means is justified only when used to achieve non-democratic, libertarian, pro-private property ends. In other words, a bottom-up revolution employs both persuasive and democratic mechanisms to secede at the individual, family, community, and local level. In a million ways, that involve turning our backs on the central government rather than attempting to bend, it, to bend its will. Secession, proper, properly understood, means withdrawing consent and walking away from D.C., not trying to capture it politically and converting the king. Secession is not a political movement. Why is the road to secession not political, at least not at the national level? Frankly, any notion of a libertarian takeover of the political apparatus in D.C. is a fantasy, and even if a political sea change did occur, the army of 4.3 million federal employees is not simply going to disappear.
Um, that's because the Republicans and the Democratic Democrats who are two wings of the same bird have already captured D.C. and they're not going to let it go. And they're going to use their employees and their military to defend it. Convincing Americans to adopt a libertarian political system, even if such an oxymoron were possible, it is a hopeless endeavor in our current culture. Politics is a trailing indicator. Culture leads political follows. There cannot be a political sea change in America unless and until there is a philosophical education and cultural sea change. Over the last hundred years, progressives have taken over, have overtaken education, media, fine arts, literature, and pop culture, and thus, as a result, they have overtaken politics, not the other way around. This is why our movement, the libertarian movement, must be a battle for hearts and minds. It must be an intellectual revolution of ideas because right now, bad ideas run the world. We can't expect a libertarian political miracle in our, to occur in, our, in an illibertarian society. Please don't get me wrong. The philosophy of liberty is going around the world and I believe we are winning hearts and minds. This is a time for boldness, not pessimism. Yet libertarianism will never be a mass, which is so, which is to say majority political movement. Some people will always support the state and we shouldn't kid ourselves about this. It may be due to genetic traits, environmental factors, family influence, bad schools, media influence, or simply an innate human desire to seek the illusion of security. But we make a fatal mistake when we dilute our message to seek approval from people who seemingly are hardwired to oppose us, and we waste precious time and energy. What's important is not convincing those who fundamentally disagree with us, but the degree to which we can extract ourselves from their political control. This is why secession is a tactically superior approach in my view, it is far less daunting to convince libertarian or liberty-minded people to walk away from the state than to convince those with a status mindset to change. What about the Federalists? Now I know what you're thinking, and so does the aforementioned Dr. Hopp. Wouldn't the Federalists simply crush any attempt at localized secession? They surely would like to, but whether or not they can actually do so is an entirely different question. It is only necessary to recognize that the members of the governmental apparatus always represent, even under conditions of democracy, a very small portion of the total population. Hop envisions a growing number of implicitly seceded territories engaged in noncompliance with federal authority. Without local enforcement by compliant local authorities, the will of the central government is not much more than hot air. It would be prudent to avoid a direct confrontation with the central government and not openly denounce its authority. Rather, it seems advisable to engage in a policy of passive resistance and non-cooperation. One simply stops to help in the enforcement of each and every federal law. Finally, he concludes as only Hop could. Remember, this is it, the 1990s. Waco, a teeny group of freaks, is one thing, but to occupy or wipe out a significantly large group of normal, accomplished, upstanding citizens is quite another and quite a more difficult thing. Now, you may disagree with Dr. Hopp as to the degree to which the federal government could actively order military violence to, tramp, to tamp down on any secessionist hotspots but his larger point is unassailable. The regime is largely an illusion, and consent to its authority is almost completely due to fear, not respect. Eliminate the illusion of benevolence and omnipotence, and consent quickly crumbles. Imagine what a committed, coordinated, libertarian base could achieve in America. 10% of the U.S. population, or roughly 32 million Amer people, would be an unstoppable force of nonviolent withdrawal from the federal leviathan. As Hobbes posits, it is no easy matter for the state to arrest or attack large local groups of citizens, 
And as American history teaches, the majority of people in any conflict are likely to be fence-sitters rather than antagonists. Left and right are hypocrites regarding secession. One of the great ironies of our time is that both the political left and right complain bitter bitterly about the other, but steadfastly refuse to consider once again the obvious solution staring us in the face. Now one might think progressives would champion the Tenth Amendment and states' rights because it would liberate them from the Neanderthal, Neanderthal right-wingers who stand in the way of their progressive utopia. Imagine California or Massachusetts having every progressive policy firmly in place without any preemptive federal legislation or federal courts to get in their way and without having to share federal tax revenues with the hated red states. Imagine an experiment where residents of the San Francisco Bay Area were free to live under a political and social regime of their liking while residents of Salt Lake City were free to do the same. Surely both communities would be much happier with this common sense arrangement than the current one, whereby both have to defer to Washington. But in fact, progressives strongly oppose federalism and states' rights, much less secession. The reason, of course, is that progressives believe they are winning and they don't intend for a minute to let anyone walk away from what they have planned for us. Democracy is the great political orthodoxy of our times, but its supposed champions on the left can't abide true localized doc democracy which is, in fact, the stated aim of secession movements. They are interested in democracy only when the vote actually goes their way, and then only in the most attenuated federal level, or preferably for progressives, the international level. The last thing they want is local control over anything. They are the great centralizers and consolidators of state authority. Live and let live is simply not in their DNA. Our friends on the right are scarcely better on this issue. Many conservatives are hopelessly wedded to the Lincoln myth and remain enthralled to the central welfare state, no matter the cost. As an example, consider the Scottish independent referendum that took place in September of 2014. Some conservatives and even a few libertarians claimed that we should oppose the referendum on the grounds that it would create a new government and thus two states would exist in the place of one, but reducing the size and scope of any single state's dominion is healthy for liberty because it leads us closer to the ultimate goal of self-determination at the individual level to granting each of us sovereignty over our lives. Again, quoting Mises, if there were in, in any way possible to grant this right of self-determination to every individual person, it would have to be done. Furthermore, some conservatives argue that we should not support secession movements where the breakaway movement is likely to create a government that is more liberal than the one it replaces. This was the case in Scotland, where younger Scots who supported the independence referendum in greater numbers hoped to create strong ties in the EU Parliament in Brussels and build a Scandinavian-style welfare state run from Hollywood. Holly Rood, never mind the Tories in London, were overjoyed with the prospect of jettisoning a huge number of Labour supporters. But if support for the principle of self-determination is to have any meaning whatsoever, it must follow for others to make decisions with which we disagree. Political competition can only benefit all of us, what neither progressives nor conservatives understand, or worse, maybe they do understand, is that secession provides a mechanism for real diversity, a world where we are not all yoked together. It provides a way for people to widely, with widely divergent views and interests to live peaceably as neighbors instead of suffering under one commanding central government that pits them against each other. Secession begins with you. Ultimately, the wisdom of secession starts and ends with the individual. Bad ideas run the world. But they must, but they must run your world. Oh, but must they run your world? The question we all have to ask ourselves is this. How seriously do we take the right of self-determination 
And what are we willing to do in our personal lives to assert it? Secession really begins at home with the actions we all take in our everyday lives to distance and remove ourselves from state authority, authority, quietly, nonviolently, inexorably. The state is crumbling all around us under the weight of its own contradictions, its own fiscal mess, its own monetary system. We don't need to win control of D.C. What we do need to do as people seeking more freedom and a better life for future generations is to walk away from D.C. and make sure we don't go down with it. How to Secede Right Now So in closing, let me make a few humble suggestions for beginning a journey of personal secession. Not all of these may apply to your personal circumstances. No one but you can decide what's best for you and your family. But all of us can play a role in a bottom-up revolution by doing everything in our power to withdraw our consent from the state. Secede from intellectual isolation. Talk to like-minded friends, family, and neighbors, whether physically or virtually, to spread liberty and cultivate relationships and alliances. The state prefers to have us autonomized without a strong family structure or social network. Secede from dependency. Become as self-sufficient as possible with regard to food, water, fuel, cash, firearms, and physical security at home. Resist being reliant on government in the event of natural disaster, bank crisis, or the like. Secede from mainstream media, which promotes the state in a million different ways. Ditch cable, ditch CNN, ditch the major newspapers, and find your own sources of information in this internet state. Internet age. Take advantage of luxury previous generations did not enjoy. Secede from state control of your children by homeschooling or unschooling them. Secede from college by rejecting mainstream academia and its student loan trap. Educate yourself using online learning platforms, obtaining technical credentials, or simply by reading as much as you can. Secede from the U.S. dollar by owning physical precious metals, by owning assets dominated in foreign currencies, and by owning assets abroad. Secede from the federal tax and regulatory regimes by organizing your business and personal affairs to be as tax efficient and unobtrusive as possible. Secede from the legal system by legally protecting your assets from rapacious lawsuits and probate courts as much as possible. Secede from the state health care racket by taking control of your health and questioning medical orthodoxy. Secede from your state by moving to another with a better tax and regulatory environment, better homeschooling laws, better gun laws, or just one with more liberty-minded people. Secede from political uncertainty in the United States by obtaining a second passport, or secede from the U.S. altogether by expatriating. Most of all, secede from the mindset that government is all-powerful or too formidable to an opponent to overcome. This state is nothing more than Bastiat's Great Fiction or Murray's Gang of Thieves writ large. Let's not give the power to make us unhappy or pessimistic. All of us, regardless of ideological bent and regardless of whatever we know whether we know it or not, are married to a very violent, abusive spendthrift. It's time, ladies and gentlemen, to get divorced from D.C. Okay, and he has his contact information. Jeff Deist Deist is president of the Mises Institute. He previously worked as chief of staff to Congressman Ron Paul and as an attorney for private equity clients. Okay. So if you want to contact him, here's his page, here's his phone number, and I believe he has a podcast somewhere, Twitter, he's got a Twitter account, all these things. So um, I have emailed him and asked him a few questions, and when he emails me, I'll post it in the comments section. But uh, here's his uh, talk in writing, and I encourage you to go to the Mises Institute, Mises.org, 
and you can just um, search secession begins at home I'll include a link in the um, description as well as some of his information and you can come down here and just uh, listen to this so that's the end of his uh, information I'd like to talk a little bit great 